when you focus on the present moment, you're trying to become friends with it. Say that you're going to focus on the breath. Find a spot in the body where it's comfortable to stay, where it feels easeful. It can be anywhere in the body, deep in the body, on the surface of the body. And allow yourself to settle in. But as you're settling in, remember you've got to make a friendship here, and that takes time, especially if you haven't been focusing much on the body or avoiding the body. Because it's all too easy when you focus on the body to come in and just say, well, this has to be that way, that has to be this way, and you start pushing the blood into different parts of the body, pushing the breath energy into different parts of the body where it doesn't feel comfortable. It's like trying to make friends with a person but not really listening to that person, not really seeing what that person needs or wants or likes. And so it's a process of mutual adjustment. Find a way of staying focused where you're not putting too much pressure on things, but you're able to maintain the steadiness of your focus. The classic image is of a baby chick that you're holding in your hand. If you squeeze it too tight, it's going to die. If you hold it too loosely, it's going to fly away. So you have to find just the right amount of pressure to apply. And then notice how the breath responds. Notice how the mind responds. And as with any friendship, sometimes you ask straight questions, and other times you simply have to be observant over time. As the Buddha once said, you don't really know a person until you've been with that person for a long time. And even then you have to be observant. If you want to see that person's virtue, you have to live with a person for a long time and be observant. If you want to learn about a person's integrity, you have to have dealings with that person for a long time and to be observant. If you want to know about the person's stamina and wisdom, you have to see how they deal with, deal with hardships. And you have to be observant. In other words, it takes time and you have to use your powers of observation. And these are the two things you really have to apply as you're practicing. So you get a sense of what works, how you can bring the body and the mind together in a way where both are comfortable. The breath is often a good way to do this, but it's not for everybody. At least in the beginning, it, some people it takes longer time than for others. But if it takes time, don't get frustrated. It's simply a matter of learning how to listen, learning how to observe, and using your ingenuity. Those two qualities, being observant and being ingenious, were the two qualities that Ajahn Fuang would stress more than anything else when he taught meditation. He say, try this. If that doesn't work, then try that. If exhausted all the teacher's ideas, well, try to think up some approaches of your own so you can feel at ease here in the present moment. Because if the mind doesn't feel at ease here, it's going to wander around all over the place and never really finds any rest. You wander out in the world and all you see are the injustices of the world. And even when people try to be nice to one another, it's built into the world that there's a lot of feeding going on. Emotional feeding, physical feeding. The simple fact that we're able to survive depends on our feeding. And somebody's going to get harmed one way or another. So if you look for a place out there for the mind to settle down and feel at ease, you're never going to find it. If you look inside, 
And in the very beginning, you look at your mind, your mind is a mess. You try to focus on the breath, the breath and the body seems to be a mess. You don't know where to go. This is where I have to take it on the Buddha's word and the word of all the people who've practiced his teachings and gotten results, that okay, if you focus inside, eventually things will settle down. Sometimes there's a resistance, but that simply means you have to be very patient and very gentle and very observant. Because if you push yourself too hard, it's like pushing yourself on someone else. You want to be a friend, but they're not so sure yet. And the more you push, the more they step back. So you have to be more gentle, more indirect. With the idea in the back of your mind, eventually you will settle down here. It just simply may take time. Because the reason we want to settle down here is we want to observe the mind. The Buddha said that before he got started on his practice, he looked at the world and he said it was like fish in a puddle that was drying up. The water is getting less and less and less, and the fish are struggling with one another to get that last little bit of water. Of course, all of them are going to die. You see, he looked at the world and just felt really dismayed. But then he turned around and he looked and he saw, well, the real problem is here in the heart. The heart's always going out there looking for happiness, but no matter how much you gain out there, you're going to lose it. At one point he said, even if it rained gold coins, we wouldn't have enough to satisfy our sensual desires. It's this arrow of craving in the heart. That's what's making us suffer. This is his real insight. No matter how bad things are outside, it is possible to develop skill inside so you don't have to suffer from those things. And if you're not making yourself suffer, you're placing less of a burden on others as well. So whatever amount of time it takes to get the mind to settle down is time well spent. I noticed when John Fuang was teaching people, people would be coming from all sorts of different directions, and his instructions for different people would sometimes seem to contradict the instructions he gives for other people. He says if someone was off to the west, and he said, we have to go east, east, east to get to the point where you want to settle down. So other people were off to the east. Well, they had to go west. And some people would go straight to the right point. Other people would take a, a while to circle around. But finally they would get to a point where they could settle down. The mind would be really still. In fact, it would be so still. Both the mind and the body would be so still that even the breath itself would stop. And once people had gotten to that point in their meditation, everything would seem balanced. The mind was balanced here in the present moment, the body seemed balanced. And from that point, everybody's practice seemed to follow the same steps. But leading up to it, some people would have really strange experiences in their body, really strange visions, positive, negative. The sense of the body would get distorted. Number one time sitting with a group, and at the end of the session, this one woman said she felt like she was sitting there with a body but no head. And well, for that hour, I'd been sitting with a sense that all I had was a head and no body. I told her we should get together. <laughs> she, by the way, was the one who gave that old blanket that I still wear. And sometimes you feel like your body's filling the whole room. Sometimes it feels really small. Sometimes it feels, seems to be nothing but pain. Other times it seems to disappear. You can do all kinds of things. And just think of it as the various distortions things go through as you're learning how to settle down.
and to emphasize that point of balance. Is when people would get to the point where the breath was still, and John Fung would have them focus on the sense of warmth in the body, the fire property. Then from there on the coolness, the liquid property, then the earth property, which was the solidity. And then he'd say, try to bring all these things into balance, so it's not too hot, not too cold, not too heavy, not too light. Try to find that sense of balance. And then when you can maintain that, okay, then you've really mastered concentration. But as with any balance, you think about those old-fashioned balances, and they swing back and forth. They go to the left, they go to the right, and it takes a while sometimes for them to reach balance. And just accept that that's part of the process of things settling down. and learn how to be patient with it, because we are developing a sense of home. In Pali this is called Vihara Dhamma, the place where the mind can stay, feels at home, feels at ease. If you compare it with a friendship, it's a friendship where finally both people are happy together, and the friendship feels easy. This is where you can settle down. The mind doesn't have to wander around so much. And that reduces a lot of its suffering right there. The Pali term for wandering around is samsara. Sometimes we think of samsara as a place. It's not really a place. It's a process the mind does. It's looking for happiness and hasn't found anything, so it keeps wandering. It tries to settle down here, can't stay there, has to move on to something else, can't stay there either. Constantly on the move. As we're meditating, we're trying to find a home, a place where it can settle down, at least long enough so it can look into itself to see, well, what is this arrow of craving? What is this arrow of clinging? What is the ignorance that keeps us suffering? And this is basically the good news of the Buddha's teachings, which is that the suffering comes from within, which means that we can cure it. If suffering were totally caused by outside circumstances, we'd be victims. There'd be nothing we can do about it. But because the primary causes are inside, once you get the mind to settle down here in the present moment, then you can look inside and figure things out. In what way are your intentions unskillful? In what way is the way you look at things unskillful? How can you change those? so that you're not constantly primed to suffer all the time. And as you dig down through those habits, you find, as you clear them away, straighten things out inside, there really is a happiness that doesn't require any work at all. It's just there. That's where the wandering stops. So as we're practicing, accept the fact that there will be some swings in the balance. But eventually the balance will come to that point of equilibrium. And at the point of equilibrium, that's where things open up. You actually go beyond the equilibrium. But this is the first step in the the direction for happiness that really is satisfying, that really doesn't require any more work, any more wandering around at all. That's what the Buddha teaches, and he teaches it as a challenge. He said, there is this possibility for true happiness. It's something human beings can attain. And so up to, it's up to us to decide whether we're, we're ready for that challenge, whether we're interested in the possibility of a happiness that's totally true, totally free. As the Buddha once said, if you could make a deal, people would come and they would stab you with 300 spears a day, 
300 in the morning, 300 at noon, 300 in the evening for 100 years, with the guarantee that at the end of 100 years you'd get an awakening. He said, if you could make that deal, it would be worth it. And when you attained awakening, you wouldn't think that you had attained it with suffering. You would, the awakening would be accompanied by joy. To happen as he promises is, is that amazing. So keep that in mind as you face difficulties in the practice. That sitting through the difficulties is its not 300 spears. And that the, the goal is more than worth the trouble of trying to develop the sense of balance, of friendship, home inside.